because some cells are more energy efficient than others. And we don't really talk about energy efficiency in batteries because we think it's higher than the combustion engine. It's so much higher. So Talking battery energy density today with our favorite battery expert, Ash from uh, Toronto. Great to have you here, Ash. And what we're seeing here is the current level of energy density CATL. They just released a new pack just last year with close to 225 250 watt per kilogram and now what would be interesting in terms of Joby, Archer, Ehang and the other electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles is what are we going to see five to ten years down the road when mass adoption will actually take place? Great, thanks Arne. I'd like to start first by saying energy density is actually not the correct term for what we're seeing here. So energy density is essentially the energy content by volume, watt hours per liter. And it's a common misconception across the industry. Everybody talks about energy density, but the correct term is specific energy. So specific energy measures watt hours per kilogram per unit weight. So the trends in specific energy have been going up quite a bit. The talk is, you know, we're improving at a rate of 8% a year. And there are some key metrics that need to be met if we are to replace combustion engines. So a gain of about 5x would essentially completely replace all the capabilities of combustion engines. And that would be fantastic if we could do this. A gain of 2x right now would essentially be the tipping point where people start adopting electric vehicles more and more. So that's in personal transportation, but also in heavy duty transportation as well. And we've demonstrated batteries that can do 400 500 watt hours per kilogram. The issue is as you pack more and more energy and you allow more and more electrons to flow, you need to beef up all the other components inside the battery. So you need to have a differentiated electrolyte, you need to have a better membrane because you can't just solve one aspect and expect all the rest to hold up. These batteries have been demonstrated, but they just aren't durable enough. And the more energy you're flowing through a battery, the more heat you get rejected. So there are better materials being developed right now to reject heat at the cell level in order to enable these higher energy densities or specific energies. In the case of EV tolls or even electric vehicles in general, I would be a little bit skeptical and very careful of that because we measure specific energy, first of all, at the cell level, and then you need to add additional equipment to turn it into a pack, right? So that reduces the specific energy. In that pack, there are different modules as well. Some companies go through modules and then take multiple modules to build a pack. Some companies go directly from cells to pack. The problem is when companies advertise a high specific energy for a new pack. Typically, that means they've removed material from the pack in order to allow more of that cell's specific energy to shine through, right? When you remove material from the pack, you make it less rigid. And so what ends up happening is, yes, your battery pack has a higher specific energy. That's great. But you've lost that structural rigidity, which you then need to make up in the vehicle, which means your vehicle now got a little bit heavier. And that's the trade-off that we're experiencing here. And especially in the EV tow space, uh, weight is absolutely critical. Joby just last year announced that they had shaved off two kilogram of one component. So if that's worth the news release, then definitely every kilo, every pound does count. So uh, are we going to see certain catalysts in the battery chemistry going forward that is also commercially scalable anytime soon that could change the trajectory there accelerate this current trend it's definitely promising there are a lot of new technologies like you mentioned so we're seeing solid state batteries coming up lithium metal batteries coming up and as I was saying the more energy you try to rush you know the more electrons that tries to flow through a battery the more stress you put on the other materials inside the battery so we're talking about the electrolyte and we're talking about the separator or the membrane and right now these two are underdeveloped that's sort of what's holding these more dense chemistries back. We can demonstrate them right now. They just don't last long enough and they degrade faster. So companies that are developing these separators are pretty interesting right now. So some companies are developing hybrid polymer separators, ceramic separators, which is very interesting. There's a small company called Electrovia in Canada that has an overbuilt separator, but they don't have the chemistry to go with it. So it's a bit of a, a component play now. We, we can have the anode and cathode for higher specific energies. Definitely, that exists. We just don't have all the other components matched up. And you just mentioned lithium metal batteries. From what I read, they have been around before, but they were very expensive. So they were used by NASA, for example, as early as the 70s and the 80s. Yeah, so lithium metal was used very carefully by NASA in very cold environments. And that was one of the few conditions that allowed them to be used safely. Because in a normal operating environment at room temperature, for example, the amount of electrons flowing through it and the amount of heat rejected 
it would just be too high. We just don't have the components ready to take it. And there's always a trade-off, right? So you can always make a membrane thicker. You beef up the membrane, you say that, okay, you're able to flow all these electrons safely. But as you make a membrane thicker, you also increase the resistance in the cell. And so at the end of the day, you'll have really high specific energy, but the energy efficiency of that cell will go down. So battery makers are trying to tune the knobs regarding all the trade-offs that they have to play with. They have to deal with energy efficiency as well, because some cells are more energy efficient than others. And we don't really talk about energy efficiency in batteries because we think it's higher than the combustion engine. It's so much higher. So why not talk about it? But when you're looking at the differences in energy efficiency of a cell and charge and discharge efficiency, it can vary from 98% to 96% to 92%. How, how far low are we willing to go? So when anybody looks at all the news coming out about increased specific energies or energy densities of battery packs, you need to match it with the application and make sure that a corresponding increase in weight is not being realized at the vehicle level. Uh, because typically that's the story we don't hear about. And when you increase the specific energy of a pack, you're going to have more heat rejection. Typically you need to have uh, more cooling systems, more pipes, higher flow rates of coolant or glycol solution. And so typically they take these components and put it into the vehicle. And the net effect of a higher specific energy pack is sort of canceled out. So that's why I'm a little bit skeptical. We need to look at the entire chain from the cell to the module to the pack all the way to the vehicle and make sure that there is a corresponding weight decrease in all these components.